We do. Did you look at the governor's bill or I'm just curious? Uh, well, the one I got before, it always confuses me. The one that I got before is different from what I saw now. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't fully reviewed it. But, um, all right, so F, then are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. All right, well. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm State Senator Jamie Eldridge, and uh, beginning a weekly Facebook Live series, Uplifting Voices, uh, to reach out to Black leaders throughout Massachusetts uh, to talk about uh, their thoughts, their ideas, uh, what they're working on right now um, in response to just massive uh, national protests um, following up on um, response to the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and just a continued conversation about racial justice, systemic racism, racial discrimination, and yes, <clears throat> police reform. So uh, each week I'll be um, writing a community leader uh, to talk about um, their work on issues and just how things are going in general. And Really, really proud and very, very excited to have um, someone who's been a friend to me for the past four years uh, that I met who reached out to me to educate me about uh, different aspects of, of police reform, uh, Jamal Crawford. Um, Jamal is a longtime activist in the city of Boston. Uh, I think those who know him know he's a very outspoken person, which is exactly what we, what we need right now in this country. And um, he, he um, created the first ever celebration of uh, Black history at Boston City Hall, first to raise the red, black, and green flag on City Hall Plaza, and has most recently advocated that May 19th be made Malcolm X Day, uh, which the Boston City Council adopted in perpetuity. Um, but we, we first got to know each other um, through his outreach to, to explain to me what police decertification was, um, which I had not heard of. Um, and you know, we had a, a briefing at the State House, I think four, four or five years ago, and um, an issue that he really knows well uh, is suddenly you know, popping up in something that, that realistically can move in the legislature and um, want to have this conversation. So Jamal, thanks so much for being on Uplifting Voices today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here. Absolutely. How, how are things going? Uh, you know, going as, 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 as well as could be expected during this uh, COVID craziness. And, uh, uh, you know, just watching the community now kind of begin to, as businesses are reopening. But I'm, I'm very concerned with a lot of the protests and the large gathering people rushing back to go to the beach or what have you. I'm very worried about this, what we know is this second coming wave. And I'm also very worried about a lot of the economics that have been going on with this because I just saw a stunning report talking about 40% uh, of black businesses uh, are most likely not going to reopen. And there was a, a variety of barriers from them getting uh, relief and assistance. One of which being that most of them were sole proprietors and a bunch of other factors. So here we are once again, the people who need the most help uh, in most crisis receiving the least amount of help. So I'm just watching the community pull back together, but me, myself, I'm doing all right. And, you know, enjoying a little bit of the weather and just trying to eat and stay healthy and stay, you know, healthy physically and mentally, most important. Uh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I, I will say as a legislator to go from, you know, usually going to multiple events throughout the day, um, you know, traveling into Boston, going to events throughout my district, just to be, you know, pretty much sitting at a, at a desk for 10 hours a day is, is a very different experience and it can get a little wearing. So. Yeah. We, yep. we miss, we miss human interaction and contact. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And, and, you know, I, I know a little bit about, you know, you and your family's roots in Boston, but I, I, I never got sort of the, the full story, but I mean, you're, you are a part of a long-standing family in, in Boston, correct? That has a lot of 
involvement in activism? Well, uh, yeah, activism and more, really more so the arts. And, you know, uh, so when my family first came here, I'm talking about, you know, my great great grandmother from Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. um, when she first came here from Jamaica, she met a black Cherokee man who was one of the first black people to work at the uh, uh, US post office. Mm -hmm. um, they got married and then had my grandmother, my aunt, and so on and so forth. And so began, you know, their mm -hmm. roots in Boston. Um, my, my grandmother, um, my mother's mother, um, uh, bought the house that I just recently, up until recently lived in, uh, mm. around Humboldt Avenue. She bought that house in 1948. Wow. And, um, you know, they had that house all that time. And, uh, you know, my family had been here, um, you know, throughout the black arts movement and so on and so forth. My, my aunt and uncle Lucy and, uh, Gus and Lucy were a very, uh, prominent, uh, seamstress couple and fashion couple that they worked for the Elma Lewis school and so on and so forth. My grandmother Winnie was a tap dancer and she had worked up and down the Eastern seaboard and all the way up into Canada with all, you know, she knew Lena Horn and, you know, uh, uh, Ray Charles and uh, uh, she knew Gregory and Maurice Hines when they were like seven years old and, you know, just on and on. So uh, uh, the stories that I grew up with, were, was a very rich black arts and black power culture. Um, uh, the kind of the, the merger between the black arts movement and the black power movement. So in the seventies, um, you know, having a rich, rich history and foundation of jazz and everything from like Dizzy Gillespie and all these people who used to come through here and Ella Fitzgerald and, you know, all the strong roots of jazz. And, you know, when Malcolm was here, scat and all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that morphing on into the 60s and 70s and the Black Power Movement um, and me being a child of the 70s uh, and then the Elma Lewis School. And, you know, it, it just it was a really special time to be born. And I'm, I'm very thankful and grateful that my family was here um, at that time and, and, and pushed me in that direction and immersed me in so mm -hmm. much arts and culture. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that's that's really interesting. What is forgive my ignorance? What is the Elma Lewis School? Oh, so Elma Lewis, uh, she was what we would call a matron of the arts. So mm -hmm. if you've ever seen the old movie or the TV show Fame, Fame, mm -hmm. I want to yep. live. It was kind of like Boston's Fame, but okay. they did they did more than just uh, uh, they did dance, drama, uh, film, you know, uh, uh, all of this. But they also did like sewing. What what my people taught the sewing. They mm -hmm. did you know kind of a home ex situation, you know, um, and 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 Black History and stuff. And this is from where Elma Lewis had the playhouse in the park. So some of these people like the Duke Ellingtons, she was the one bringing them into Franklin Park and whatnot. And they had concerts with thousands of people. Uh, and also too, if you've ever heard of the Black Nativity, which is, uh, okay, so the Langston Hughes play production, they are the ones who produced it in Boston from, you know, the seventies on. And, Ebony fashion flair and all of these things that were kind of staples of the black arts and entertainment time. Uh, once again, Elma Lewis, she was a matron of the art. Oh, and another thing, you know, her family was great friends with Minister Louis Farrakhan. Okay. Both of their parents, uh, they were raised up as Garveyites. So there was a connection there to the old school Marcus Garvey movement and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is generational and, and, and the merger of, once again, black arts, black power, but also to uh, black people who were born here, uh, along with uh, 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 black people from Jamaica or every other place in the Caribbean that you could think of, um, um, along with uh, Cape Verdean, mm -hmm. along with Latino. And so mm -hmm. our community has always had a very rich, you know, uh, uh, gumbo, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and what is, you talk about black art, what is the state of black art today in Boston? Well, in Boston, I mean, it, 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 it still survives and, and I don't wanna say thrives. Mm -hmm. uh, much like other things, uh, a lot of these things have now been co-opted by uh, larger nonprofit organizations who tend sure. to be white and, you know, uh, suburban. Mm -hmm. And so they're the ones holding the purse strings on the money. Um, yeah. 
And unlike in the 60s and the 70s, where a lot of these people were able to get like, I don't know, an abandoned house and strike a deal with the city and the city would give it to them for a dollar. You know what I mean? And they fix it up with the community. You know, uh, city's not giving up houses for a dollar anymore. Right. <laughs> um, so these type of things, you know, those sweetheart deals and, and it just kind of dried up. So mm -hmm. um, while black art still lives and survives, um, I think it does so in spite of there is, and, and Boston has an active arts community, but just like everything else, Boston has an active, you know, philanthropic community, uh, active, mm -hmm. you know, uh, financial community. But when you look at these things, when you see who are the people at the top of the heap, you know, it gets more lily white, the higher you go up and arts is no okay. different. So, mm -hmm. um, we have some great artists in this city though. Uh, people like, uh, Valerie Stevens, mm -hmm. who is a amazing uh, songstress, um, as well as uh, an amazing storyteller. We got people like uh, my good friend, uh, Vernon Robinson, who goes by VCR, who has the longest running uh, spoken word open mic uh, event mm -hmm. in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, we have people like Jeff Robinson from the Jeff Robinson Trio, uh, uh, Lizard Lounge, uh, right outside of Harvard Square. And they have the longest running open mic in Cambridge. And so there's a bunch of people who are do doing stuff. Uh, uh, Akiba Abaka, who's doing wonderful things with black theater. Um, 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 oh, my sister, uh, Abria. Abria, who is over at um, um, Berkeley and doing wonderful things in, in art. I think today was her birthday too. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people who are doing some wonderful things, but there needs to certainly be more and it needs to be funded and supported, created for and by the people who are the originators and drivers of the culture. Mm -hmm. and, and, and do you think at this moment, especially with a, a Boston City Council that, you know, a lot of focus now that the majority of the members are, are, are elected officials of, of, of color and there's a, a shift, uh, hopefully a shift that will be long lasting around investment in, you know, black and brown communities. I mean, do you think that that could be there could be more investment through whether through the city or the state is that so possible, you think? so i'm not an optimist i try not to be a pessimist <laughs> try to be a realist but you yeah. know i must say that i do have a, a, a healthy dose of you know uh cynicism in there you know mm -hmm. based yeah. on prior experiences and Ooh. so while i would love you know, to be completely optimistic, I have to say that I'm cautiously optimistic because it's not the first time I heard this type of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, around police reform, let's say, you know, Rodney King tore mm -hmm. up the whole city. And, you know, people will certainly talk about reform. But, you know, years later, it, it, it yeah. fizzles and drizzles off. And we've been here before. Trayvon Martin, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Crawford at the Walmart. I mean, so many multiple situations that are not just at the hands of police, but citizens, yeah. citizens who want to be the police, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I think about my mother with Christianity. You want to mm -hmm. win new people. You want to win new souls. Right. So if every time somebody just, just now they accepted the Lord, you don't want to be the guy to beat them up because you've been right. saved for 20 years, right? Um, yep. You don't want to call them stupid because they just might have saw the light. Right, right. So, you know, if now people are talking about this more, we want to let as many people into the camp as we can. But the people who also just got in can also not be the leaders. Sure. They can't be the ones who are now saying, hey, we're going to tweak this law because up until two weeks ago, you weren't paying attention to any of this. Right, right. So, you know, it would behoove folks to listen and whatnot. And I'm glad for this newfound enthusiasm and newfound outrage. But in my experience, those things are not the things that you build the movement on. Those things tend to fizzle out quickly. Right, right. Okay. And and so with, with that in mind, then, you know, um, how, you know, you get the sense of, you know, describing black art and you mentioned, you know, black power. So what, you know, what sort of issues or work have you been doing in, in the city as it relates to police reform or racial justice, uh, you know, in your career and your time? 
So, I mean, you know, literally it's too much to mention. So, right, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do just the recent stuff. Yep, so, yep. you know, I've been pushing for a civilian review board for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it has been like trying to push a boulder up a, up a, up a mountain, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the spirit of kind of what we just said, now everybody seems really keen on a civilian review board. Mm -hmm. So, fine. I don't want to poo-poo on the idea if people are now ready to move on it, great. Now the question is, of course, well, what's it gonna look like? So mm -hmm. now we have to shape it. My idea of a civilian review board is novel. There's, to my knowledge, nothing like it across the country. Mm -hmm. As activists, I long ago determined uh, errors that we made. One of the errors that we made is that when we focused on police reform, we only focused as it pertained to police brutality and the killing of civilians. Mm -hmm. And I separate the two because police brutality is anything that happens to you and you can go home and tell the story. Sure. You're all bust up, but your girlfriend can put some ice on your face, right? Mm -hmm. The killing of civilians is obviously final, yep. okay? And, mm -hmm. and, and no, no coming back from that. And while it is the most extreme force of police brutality, I want to make a distinction. Right. Mm -hmm. So so that um, if people are now talking about these things and whatnot, great. I just want them to listen to folks like me who said, if we only focus on police brutality and the kill killing of civilians, mm -hmm. we're missing most of the battle. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we're automatically limiting on ourselves to a very small focal point. Mm -hmm. The bulk of police corruption and misconduct is all of the regular stuff, the mundane stuff mm -hmm. that, that happens every day, the drunk driving, the domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that the cop who beat up Tyrone in my neighborhood, little 16 year old Tyrone, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you that that same cop has been practicing on his wife probably for the past five to seven years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that what we'll, what we'll notice is that these same officers Clearly, if you're beating up a kid on the street or if you're beating up your wife at home, what's that speak to? Clearly, you have a rage issue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, that rage is also tied into substance abuse or alcohol abuse or what have you. And if we start looking at the totality of the way that officers screw up, we're going to find a common thread. And that's how we're going to find where all the bad apples are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good cops don't want bad cops. Mm -hmm. So we have to come up with a logical and sound mechanism to not get into a big, you know, hissy fight with the unions and all these other people. Because if we put forth the policy in the right way, no one is going to be able to logically, uh, who can logically say, we think it's good to have officers on the force who have done sexual assault and rape. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree that that's generally frowned upon, okay? Yeah. So, bam. Mm -hmm. We would also say that, uh, uh, you know, domestic violence is one of mm -hmm. the biggest calls that they have to answer themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you have to answer that call yourself, shouldn't you be free of that thing yourself? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I don't want rapists answering the rape call. Mm -hmm. I don't want people who are domestic abusers answering the domestic abuse call. Mm -hmm. I don't want people who are drunkards and have problems with drunk driving answering the drunk driving calls. And if you have now become an officer, you've gone through the academy, you mm -hmm. swore but before, you know, you, you put a hand on a Bible, your family was there, you put your hands up with the white gloves and everything, you know mm -hmm. you're not supposed to be beating not only your wife, but your girlfriend or any other woman for that matter, mm -hmm. right? You know you're not supposed to be doing cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know you're not supposed to be doing illegal steroids. Mm -hmm. You know you're not supposed to be driving under the influence, whether mm -hmm. that's on duty or in your private life, mm -hmm. on vacation in Arizona. I don't care. You're not supposed to drink and drive. Mm -hmm. So yep. if, if the citizens have to be beholden to that, wouldn't it be fine for the people who are the public servants Mm -hmm. The taxpayers pay for the stiff and, and waving my flag. Taxpayers <laughs> and the citizens and all that. Shouldn't we be able to say, hey, 
We want to know what the good guys are up to because they're supposed to be the good guys. And if the good guys are up to bad stuff, we weed them out. Mm -hmm. This to me is such common. This is not even revolutionary or radical talk here. This is like super patriotic. This is right. Right. America, the beautiful stuff I'm talking here. <laughs> right? So I don't get how there's an opposition to this. And so these are the things we need to move forward on. And in terms of race, racial dialogues. You know, the city has played around with it. People have done it. But you know what we really need to have? Oh, wouldn't it be great if Charlie Baker and the legislators, we, we should have a statewide racial dialogue. Sure, yeah. And, you know, we'll do it by region. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll do, you know, we'll do the east. We'll do the Cape and the Islands. We'll mm -hmm. do west. We'll do the middle. Right. Yeah. We'll, do, we'll do the whatever it is, the Berkshires. Whatever, oh, it's all broke down by region. Let, right, we need right. statewide racial dialogue. OK, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. encompasses not just policing. Mm -hmm. Right. But all the instances of hate crimes. And look. Um, sexual and gender crimes as well, mm -hmm. because. Absolutely. Every crime that gets listed as a hate crime, let's say against LGBTQ, right? Mm -hmm. How does that get broken down as a demographic? Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. it a white gay person or, or a black gay person? Mm -hmm. sure because was. I can guarantee while they were beating up the white gay person, they were just calling them, you know, the usual epithets, right? Yep. But when it's the black one, they get to add a bonus word, <laughs> yep. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Whether you are Latino, or Cape Verdean, or Black, or Asian, you are going to be that word plus right. exactly. the other epithets. Yep. So I don't know how the hate crime data is broken down and all this type of stuff, um, but I think we need to take a severe look at it because Massachusetts, the, the bastion of liberalism and progressives <laughs> and, you know, it's a farce. Yep. And right here, Absolutely. we're talking about symbolism what about the flag, the Massachusetts state flag? How yeah. quickly that little discussion got burnt out. Yeah, we're trying to revive that now in the Beacon Hill. Yep, to change it. Mm -hmm. yep. Anybody want to talk about Plymouth? Mm -hmm. See, people talk about Boston. You know, they talk about is Boston racist? I made a case. It's not Boston. Like, it's not right. This is this is the origins of racism on the, the the northern in northern america mm -hmm. this is the wow. epicenter this is ground zero right the first right. original 13 colonies yep exactly and as was said in the malcolm x movie where plymouth rock landed on us right right mm -hmm. i can drive there in 45 minutes <laughs> yep mm -hmm. so so and not just that but also to up north the northeast once again, the progressives, the Yankees, we're not like those old, you know, those old uh, hillbillies down south, you know. But up here was the intellectual basis for racism and white supremacy. Sure, yeah. Up here came the studies from Harvard and Yale. Mm -hmm. Hitler even. Hitler got his concept. He was like, oh, that's a good idea. Eugenics. Mm -hmm. Eugenics came from Yale. Yep. They adopted it. The 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 uh the the the, the Rockefeller Foundation funded it. Mm -hmm. So places like Harvard and institutions like Yale, once again, is it racist or not? They they are the ones who said, like, you know, we think black people might grow tails at night. Let's mm -hmm. experiment on that. Black people's exactly. brains are smaller. Mm -hmm. Remember all that phrenology and all this type of stuff? Yep. yep. So this has long been the intellectual bastion. Kevin Peterson right now talking about uh, uh, renaming Faneuil Hall. And Perfect. was Faneuil Hall a good guy? No. Faneuil Hall was a wicked guy. Slave okay. owner. But he owned five slaves. George Washington owned 300. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, Zabdiel Boylston. He experimented on slaves with smallpox. He is the guy who first mm -hmm. found out that you could weaponize smallpox and put it into the blankets. Mm -hmm. See, I did not know that. Yep. It's a wicked history we have right here. We don't have to go far. 
We don't have to look for the boogeyman in the Ku Klux Klan down right, south, right. Cleotis who's spitting out tobacco. No, it's right up here. It's Buffy and Biffy on the yacht and Summering on Nantucket in the vineyard and all this. No, it's very, you know, it's sweaters tied around their waists and their necks and stuff. Right. Loafers and moccasins. Let's not be fooled. Mm -hmm. This is a very vicious racism up here, too. And you think if, if the curriculum in our schools had that kind of education, you think that that would, would help? It would help change people's views? Uh, yeah, but I mean, you, now, once again, these are long-term effects. You know, yeah. you yep. legislate something now to hope it has an effect on a 20 year old kid, you know, 20 years from now, you know what I mean? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes, it would have some, but it's not gonna mitigate obviously the damage already done. And you know, yep. people have been talking about issues like reparations on a, on a national and global scale. But mm -hmm. once again, statewide, I think that there needs to be statewide reparations right here because mm -hmm. Massachusetts has hurt its native citizenry. First of all, the indigenous people here, yep. right? Mm -hmm. The Mashpee, the Wampanoag, all this, right? All, all of that, right? Um, um, What's the place they still got called out there? Indian Leap. I think they just changed the name of that finally and all this. Mm -hmm. But yep. there are sites that, that praise the genocide and the massacres and whatnot. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, first, the First Nations people, let alone then when you get to my people, right? right. Yep. Then you, then, you know, and, and, and let alone too, well, when when Asian people, particularly Chinese people, when they got here, they, they were, of course, treated nicely, of course. Right. No, they, <laughs> they got a horrible treatment, too. Yeah. Yeah. So the only types of things that happen with immigrant populations, as you know, because the Irish got here, they had mm -hmm. a hell of a way. But, you know, they were not enslaved and all this type of thing. Right. Um, Italians who got here once again, they had a hell of a way to go. And you're talking about people who took some really tough jobs to you know, at the docks and, you know, za -da -da -da, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and so, so I get it, but, and, and Jewish people as well. Right. Um, sure. Sure. But, but then what ended up happening is um, in a couple of generations, there were not those lingering effects. Right. So in a couple of generations, Irish and Italians were running the construction industry, the, 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 the fish docks, the, the 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 police the fire um and so now you know a couple of generations later they're doing quite well for themselves yeah you know? and it's, now they won't tell you story. that there's a great story about how the italians became white and in part they used columbus to say oh no you know we're we we've always been white whereas italians were discriminated against a lot when they first came here yep and and as you know Ellis Island, the renamings, you know, mm -hmm. all of the, uh, the the Slavic names where all of that got dropped off. You know, uh, you were Drewinsky. Now you're just Drew, <laughs> you know, uh, all of these type of things because uh, uh, all of that. But but at the end of the day, if people are looking at you, mm -hmm. you look white to me, mm -hmm. even even Jewish people who obviously had a hell of a way to go by their other uh, white counterparts. Right. Um, because they were obviously first chased all through Europe. And then when they came to America, uh, the Yankee gave them hell, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the blue bloods and all that gave them hell. Um, um, and, and they were, you know, had forced to suffer. And up until this day, um, now that they've, you know, been able to find their own ways and their various, um, uh, what do you call it? in various industries that they're in, whether it's lawyers, accountants, I mean, where, where are they not? You know what I mean? They have fully integrated into American society and the majority of them are doing quite well for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But somehow for my people, um, there's just disdain. Mm -hmm. It just, for whatever reason, does not, well, not for whatever reason, there's very specific reasons. Anti-blackness, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And 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 too with policies like the redlining and you know I couldn't get a loan the same way somebody else could get a loan, and mm -hmm. and even if you were an, an an Irish bricklayer, you could get a loan for a house before the black doctor, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so uh, those type of things helped people build wealth at different rates and so on and so forth. And now we're playing catch up, mm -hmm. you know, and um. Once again, with some of the things that were done in the state of Massachusetts, 
and with some of the industries that are here now. You're talking about biotechnology and, you know, health and stuff like that. These people make gazillions of dollars. Yep. And mm-hmm. there should be some sort of thing would say, hey, you need to kick back into these neighborhoods to not only help us repair infrastructure and kick into that since you're good citizens of the state of the Commonwealth, right? Mm-hmm. But also too, to help us develop programs so that we're cultivating the next generation of where's the kid in my neighborhood who's going to work at Genzyme in the future. Mm-hmm. Or back back in then, we were, we were hoping that kids would get jobs at Polaroid. Now there's no more Polaroid, you know what I mean? <laughs> but So we have to keep up with the technology to see where is this group of kids going? This, mm-hmm. this set of fifth graders now, where are they going to work when they graduate college? Mm-hmm. And we have to be preparing for that. And I think that these people need to be buying into that and and and, yep. and, and, and paying into that. So is that so that is sort of the state, you know, whether it's raising taxes or whatever, investing in, in, in communities. I mean, is that is that a key piece to to dismantling systemic racism? I think that's a piece. And I think that it mm-hmm. goes beyond just like just a tax. I mean, that's cool to raise some revenue or something like that. But I mean, Mm -hmm. literally like a real conversation. Imagine if, look, after the marathon bombing, everybody had this really heartfelt moment, like, hey, we're all together. We're, you know, Boston strong. But like a real Mm -hmm. conversation in a city like Boston, fine. Mm -hmm. It could be done in Boston. But statewide, a guy like Charlie Baker that convenes some of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, big wigs from from Mm -hmm. all the major industries uh, uh, across the state and says, hey, fellas and ladies, right? Uh, uh, we need you to, to chip in here. You know, mm-hmm. the boat is sinking. We're going to pass out buckets and we need everybody to get to bailing mm-hmm. and asking people, hey, what can you offer? Because obviously we could just hit you in your pockets, but we, we come from a place where people pride themselves, quote unquote, on we are thought leaders. We're the best in the country. And, you know, we're, we're all about innovation here and we have the tough discussions, but I don't really see that. I see, I see people really wimping out from the tough discussions and running from them like little, little wimps. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what I would like to see is everybody put on your big boy, your big girl pants. Right. Mm -hmm. And really have a real conversation about what can we contribute? Look, I don't have anything financial to offer because I'm poor. Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. I have a brain trust up here. And so Mm -hmm. what I can offer is vision is concept is policy. It's, it's, you know, uh, uh, a moral compass. Those are the things Mm -hmm. I can do. So what we have to do is figure out who is out there, who can give what we can't Mm -hmm. ask everybody to give the same thing. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of these people who are at the high look from, from the doctors, I want the health plan. From the lawyers, I want the legal plan. A guy like me could say, hey, the subject is reparations. But now you lawyers, it would be up to you guys to draw up what that looks like. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. We need to look up existing case law and all this type of stuff. I can I can get all the health people together and say, we need to attack these health disparities. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be up to the doctors to do it. Mm-hmm. The oncologist, the gynecologist, the, I, don't, I can't even name them all. So why would I think that I could lead it just because I'm smart and cute? No, we need to let the experts do what the experts do at their level, but just be driven with the spirit of the people to say, this is the goal we want. Mm -hmm. Now it's up for you guys to figure it out. Look, we need to, we we need to go to Mars. Now Mm -hmm. we get the rocket ship builders and say, you have to build a rocket ship that is capable of getting us from Mm -hmm. here to Mars. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And it's interesting talking about the inability for us to have that conversation is <clears throat> I was watching a clip of Trevor Noah from the, the Daily Show, you know, <clears throat> grew up in, in South Africa and saying, you know, that, that in South Africa, you know, when apartheid ended, they had a truth and reconciliation commission yep. and there was an admission of the harm and that South Africans, whether, you know, black, white, biracial, you know, are able to have a conversation about the harm that white South Africans, you know, caused. But that, that here, we've never had that. And more often than not, white people are very defensive and all oh, without, you know, I, that wasn't, that wasn't me. I, you know, that's, 
those are my ancestors or, you know, you can't blame me and, and not being willing to have that conversation, you know? So it's very interesting you say that because uh, one of my mentors is Matulu Shakur. He mm -hmm. is the, uh, the father of Tupac Shakur uh, mm -hmm. and uh, political prisoner, uh, Black Panther. He's locked up right now. He's been locked up since 1986. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Matulu years ago put this on me. And when Matulu gives you a mission, it's, you can't, he gives you an offer you can't refuse. So uh, he put this on my plate and he had broke down the whole thing, the TRCs as they're called. And he put me onto the whole South African process. Now the South African process, good. It, you know, it was a little bit flawed because at the end of the day, it really let off uh, a lot of the Africaneers who were really guilty of some war crimes and, and crimes against humanity. Absolutely. And so it's one thing if the black man is getting up there telling the story on when the uh, the bear wool dog uh, uh, ripped my leg off, and then and then the white guy is admitting, yeah, I remember that day. It was crazy, and then not, and then nothing happens to him after. Right. You know what I mean? So that yeah. was difficult. Yeah. And yeah. some of those videos are actually available still on YouTube if you look up the South African TRC. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very gut wrenching. Uh, mm -hmm. I would encourage anybody to maybe take a look at some of the stories that emerged mm -hmm. out of there. Um, but yeah, a lot of these people. Uh, the TRC, they skated because they should have been prosecuted for really crimes against humanity and war crimes in like a world tribunal, no different Absolutely. than a Nazi war criminal. Um, so in any event, Matula Shakur as a political prisoner, his idea was to adopt the TRC model to do that for America. Mm -hmm. And there's an old thing uh, by old black revolutionaries that, that uh, says, America, we charge you. We charge you with genocide. And it's a it's kind of a fictitious play of America getting charged with all the crimes against the world and humanity that they've done. Mm -hmm. um, and so also very interesting concept. But the TRC would kind of be like that. Me, myself, um, taking from Matulu's thing that would bring America into the conversation to talk about its handling of all the political prisoners who are, you know, prisoners of conscience right now. Mm -hmm. um, plus all the other crimes that they've committed against the, 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 the descendants of Africans here in America um, and, and other places where they've gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I took that and I thought we should adopt that to a local model. So literally when Boston started talking about these racial dialogues, I, had, I suggested to them a TRC model. Because see here in Boston, even since the busing, see some of the white guys, who threw the rocks and went screaming, N-word, go home. They're still here. Some of them are captains of industry or finance. They're still here. They are power brokers in the city of Boston. And so to me, I think that it's important that we, you know, uh, 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 tell the truth and shame the devil. And we put the names to the names so that, if we were able to do something like that now, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, I'll give you two examples. Both of them are now passed on. Jim Kelly and Dapper O'Neill. Uh, looks like we lost a senator. Well, I hope it's still live. I'm gonna keep going. And, and, and hopefully it says live on Facebook. So I'm gonna keep going and hope we go on. I hope he comes back. But we had two live examples here with uh, Jim Kelly and Dapper O'Neill, both who have passed away, okay? Um, uh, but both of those people were involved back in the busing. And there was a documentary on it called Eyes on the Prize, which is a famous documentary. And there was an episode specifically about uh, the history of Boston during the busing era. And both of these people were prominently featured. And so if they were still alive, they would be two prime candidates to participate in a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course, if they wanted to, right? Um, um, because these are people who were there at the time, who were engaged in the chasing away of buses, engaged in the, the terrorizing of Black children and some of the, the racist rhetoric of the day. So I would like to see that. Um, now, let me see here. I would love to see a Truth and Reconciliation Committee or Commission here in Boston and, and in the statewide level. Afnan, are you still there? Afnan. Afnan, are you still there? <laughs> 